This episode of the Brilliance Plus Passion podcast is brought to you by Groundhog Day is an event, not a business strategy. Are you ready to finally solve those pesky issues that keep holding back your business success and never seem to go away? Embrace the power of the spring formula that unearths the issues and opportunities burrowed beneath the surface and grow your business so you thrive from your intersection of your brilliance and your passion. Claim your copy today at www.thegroundhogbook.com. Welcome to the Brilliance Plus Passion Podcast. Join us as we celebrate entrepreneurs, business creators, and brilliant minds who reveal what they are doing to make the world a better place by being part of it. Be sure to visit our website at www.brilliancepluspassion.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now sit back, lean in, tune in, get your notepad and two pens ready, and let's get started. My name is Adam Homey. I am your host, and I am honored by your wise decision to tune in and invest in yourself today. Right now, we are speaking with Lana McGarra, who is known as a spiritual healer, revealing modern mythology. That in itself is very interesting. She's been a spiritual healer, ordained minister, inspirational speaker, and network TV host, as well as an award-winning, best-selling author and ghostwriter of more than 35 books with a million sold. At her website, she has some gifts for you, which we'll discuss a little bit later. And for now, let's bring you on. Lana, welcome aboard. Thank you so much, Adam. It's my joy to be here. I'm really excited about this too. So the first question is, how does the work you do make the world a better place for your clients, customers, and society at large? Well, I'm a spiritual healer. So my work happens on a couple different levels. First of all, the personal level, where I specialize in helping people to release deep traumas that are holding them back and keeping them stuck from what they want in their life. Why can't I succeed? Why can't I do what I want to do? That kind of thing. And then I have the public life where I'm a speaker, a writer. And I, my goal is to wake people up by challenging ideas that, that they think are common knowledge in the 21st century, because we still believe a lot of things that just aren't true. Okay. Just indulge me for a second on an example of one of those, because I love the uh, whole study of truth. It's my belief there's no such thing as the truth. I believe there are facts. I believe there are things that can be proven to exist. However, I believe the truth is something each of us views through our own eyes as a result of our own education experience and how we've come to the world. So give me an example of what you're referring to and your thoughts on what I just said. Sure. Uh, getting older means going into decline. That's a big myth. Yeah. So what I've actually sat in doctor's offices and seen charts where it shows you how bent over your back should be at a certain age. And I look at that and go, What? I know mountain climbers in their mid seventies. I know women who have become an artist at the age of 85. And, and one lady that I know of is uh, 103 still doing showings in New York city and art galleries. So why is it just a given that because you reach 60, you're supposed to start slowing down. It doesn't happen for everybody, but it is a myth and it is greatly fostered in the media and all these other places. When you get over a certain age, you're going to start having aches and pains. You're not going to have as much energy and all these other things. That's just a myth. Hey, everybody has an ailment that's randomly assigned to them after they turn 40. I, I have mine. Everybody I know who's over 40 has theirs. But that is a difference between uh, the car gets a little ding on it versus the transmission blows. I can look no further than my own grandfather who at age 68 took up physical fitness for the first time after his hip replacement. Yes. A 68-year-old man who just got his hip replaced. You would think, and they would perhaps set the expectation, that he would be someone to slow down. That's when he started speeding up. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm getting at. And there are yeah. dozens of them. Yeah, and he got a good 20 more years out of his life too. So, yeah. and they were and they were mostly good productive years as well. So, 
That's awesome. Now, you mentioned uh, your work as a spiritual healer. So tell us a little bit more so people understand what it is you actually do. When someone has a problem or they see a block, you know, like a roadblock, like I want to be a writer, but when I sit down to write, my mind goes blank or something like that. I want to take my business to the next level and it just isn't happening. Or I've been in all kinds of support groups and they are, just aren't doing me any good. I just keep going back to the same behavior. That is a sign that there's something simmering underneath. And so what I do in my practice is I will go help help the person identify where that started. There's There has to be a first day. Uh, an infant, a little child crawling around on the floor doesn't have these issues. They had to start somewhere. And so that's what I do. I help people through my spiritual practice, through hypnosis, NLP, and some other psychological stuff uh, to marry the two of them to go in and really get to the root of the issue. And the really great thing is those things can be resolved very quickly and easily. It is not a tough, long process to weed those things out. The, the challenge is to identify them, find out what it is. Yeah. But uh, that's what I do. I've had the opportunity to study and do some work with things like, uh, as, as a consumer, with things like resonance repatterning, uh, studying inherited trauma, past life regression, those sorts of things. Now, that may not be exactly, or, or may be, I don't know, similar to what you do, but it goes back to actually a very similar premise that there was some seminal event that in many cases happened outside of our consciousness, or if it was in our consciousness, quickly got buried, that rears itself like a boomerang 30 years later. Now, I used to do this thing where when I made that reference of the boomerang hitting you 30 years later, I'd do this and my hat would fly off. So I'm not going to do it now, but you get the idea. That's kind of how it is. Like it clunks in the head. Yeah. Like, how the hell did that just happen? Yeah. Yeah. So, it can, in, go ahead. It could be buried memories. It could be forgotten things. It could be stuff that you've just squelched so much that, you know, it's not even there. It's not, you can ask questions all day long. You're not going to come up with it. We, we bury right. those things pretty deep. Right. So in your experience, what are three of the most frequently asked questions you get from folks who are going through their process of making their decision to work with you? Well, uh, one of them is, uh, what are all my options? Uh, what, what do you do? How much can you do? And, and what can I, you know, get it? What benefits can I get uh, from working yeah. with you? There's a lot of stuff uh, we talked about getting rid of the old bad stuff. But there's also another flip side to that, and that is adding some good stuff, getting you clear on your purpose, uh, improving your skills, focus and self-confidence and things like that. Um, the second question would be, how do I take charge of my life? I, I feel so drowning. I'm, I'm a victim. I just can't seem to get a hold of things. And that's that's another one, especially for somebody who's done the support group circuit, you know, where they. They go and they hear everybody else's problems and they leave depressed. So taking charge of your life is a big, big deal. And when we get down to it, really, people know what's going on. The problem is they just don't want to deal with it or make the changes that's necessary. And so there's where the there's where the crux of the matter is. And so it's going a little bit deeper, a little more behind the actual issue that's surfacing. And then the last one we've already talked about a little bit. What are the myths that I believe that are holding me back? That's a big one because those things are so ingrained in us that we don't even know it. We don't even realize that we're following a myth. The best thing is sometimes we don't even know that we're supposed to have questions, much less what those questions are. And it's not our fault. It's just a matter of the information that's been available to us, even if we went and sought it out. That's, yes. just, that's just the way it is. Now, what are a couple of questions you wish people would ask? Ah, what I wish people would ask is, what more can I do? <laughs> because when I get someone and I work with someone, they feel so much relief and they've got this joy and this euphoria on their face. And they're like, yes, I've got it now. And I'm like, oh, you only got like a third. Uh, you know, there's more. There's more. Don't cut yourself short. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's shift gears a little bit and let's get to know Laura a little bit better. What would people 
who know you be surprised to learn about you? Well, besides being an author and ghostwriter of more than 35 books, I'm the, also the mother of seven adult children. Congratulations. And I wrote my, I wrote most of my books while living in the jungles of the Caribbean uh, with wow. my seven children. Yeah. <laughs> what do you hope people say about you when you're not around to hear it? Well, I think really authenticity uh, is what I want people to see in me and to have confidence that I'm completely open. I'm an open book. I will tell you what I think. All you have to do is ask me because I learned a long time ago that trying to fudge or or just, you know, so say the party line, I guess you would say it just doesn't work. And I that's when I started to really key in on these myths that people believe because it challenges us to uh, become authentic, not just follow along with what someone else has con really conditioned us to do. Right. If you go back in time and change one thing that you've done or it's happened with you, what would it be and why? Well, I have to tell you, I wouldn't change a thing. Okay. I that really seems to be the number one that. answer, by the way. What's that? That seems to be the number one answer, by the way, but go <laughs> ahead. Yes, my 30-year marriage ended in divorce. It was abusive and all that. But, you know, I had my seven children and so many life lessons. It, it took me where I am today. And I love my life. I absolutely love my life. I love what I uh, do when I work with people and I see people's lives changed. So I wouldn't change anything. I don't think anything is ever wasted. Wow, that's awesome. I love that. What famous person, alive or dead, would you like to meet? And what questions would you have for them if you had the opportunity? Yogananda. Yogananda. Okay. Yeah. Tell, tell us a bit more. Well, Yogananda was enlightened and he was, uh, he's considered to be an ascended master. And so he did things that are seen as impossible. He could levitate. He could do, you know, transport himself different places and things. He performed miracles and he was just a person, you know, he grew up in India, just a kid and, I, I want to know how he did that. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask him that. <laughs> well, certainly. Now, what motivates and inspires you to keep going when you're having a tough time or facing a challenge? Meditation. Meditation okay. is my key because it goes, it calms the mind so the answers can come. All the chatter keeps the answers away. So in meditation, that quiet space, I can get clear. Things that bothered me, they, they just calm down and I can take a good look at them in a better way. That's powerful. So finally, I know you have a special gift for our listeners and we're going to get to that in just a minute. But in general, right now, what is one action you would want our listeners to take as soon as they finish streaming this episode? I would like them to ask a question to themselves. What myths do I believe that simply aren't true? If you ask that question, things will start to come to your attention and you will be surprised what comes up. That's that's really interesting. And again, since I have done a lot of work myself with bifurcating what truth versus facts are, uh, that is something that has a particular personal resonance with me. Uh, the, the words facts and truth have been so, in my opinion, bastardized that I think that in itself is part of the problem. Facts are facts, but truth is what we live with. Yes, absolutely. Just that one thing, you said it so beautifully, will change your life. Yeah, I myself, um, you know, I've, I have an analogy for this, by the way, that you may find relevant, you may want to take it with you or, or not, whatever. Uh, but I'll share it with you. Polygraph tests are considered in many cases to be inadmissible in a court of law because they are not fact-based. Here's what that means. If you are if you are asked a question on a polygraph and you give an answer, the polygraph is not fact-checking you. It is testing your physiology for signs of prevarication, which means simply are you giving an authentic response? Or are you giving a response that is manufactured and therefore untrue based on what your truth is? For this reason, three people could view the same incident from three different angles, could each take polygraphs, give wildly 
divergent and mutually contradictory explanations of what happened, and all three of them could pass that test. Because it's a matter of the truth they saw in their eyes. The facts are what the facts are. And if there was a such thing as the truth, we wouldn't have trials because people would just know. Absolutely. It is all yeah. perspective, isn't it? And if you are speaking your truth, that's authenticity, whether right. the fact checkers agree or not. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So when you can bifurcate facts and truth, you and I can agree on facts, even if our interpretations of those facts are differently. And then that becomes a question of values and judgment, where we have an opportunity to create something together that is better and more positive than each either one of us could have done on our own. Yes, indeed. Yeah. True. So, yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> All right, so let's tell, so, so people what you got going on here. Uh, folks should visit your website right now. They should go to www.lanamikara. That's spelled L-A-N-A-M-C-A-R-A dot com. And what they're going to find on the homepage of the website is a resource on how to remove negative thinking in seven minutes or less. So click the tab on spiritual healing uh, or the link on spiritual healing, and you will find that. And with that, Lana, thank you so much for being with us today. It's been an honor and believe me in education. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you for tuning into the Brilliance Plus Passion podcast, where we celebrate entrepreneurs, business creators, and brilliant minds who are making a difference for their community, market, and audience. Remember to visit our website at www.brilliancepluspassion.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Brilliance Plus Passion Podcast. Thank you.